I'd like to call order, please. I would like to call order and welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we will have a brief announcements period. Then our speaker will speak. Then we shall have our question and answer period. Again, questions, not rebuttals, because after the questions period, you get a chance to rebut. Depending on the time you'll be able to get from three to five minutes. All right. Tonight's, all right, there are two rules to the college. One is no personal attacks, and the other is one rule at a time. Tonight's speaker is Germinal G. Van, author and political essayist. The purpose of this lecture is to explain why egalitarianism is a goal that's impossible to achieve. Seeking equality requires coercion by the state as the state is used to, as the great equalizer to enforce equality. The state must deprive the haves of their property and give it to the have-nots. Egalitarianism by seeking equality generates in fact more inequality between the haves and the have-nots. Let's welcome Germinal. So, um, good evening everyone, thank you for having me here. This is my third time being at the College of Complexes and it is always an honor. And it is, it is of course a, uh, an intellectual challenge. So today I'm going to present to you guys a book which is entitled The Problem of Egalitarianism, a Philosophical Examination on the Precursor of Inequality. So here's a copy, so you can pass it along if you want. How much are they? Uh, 12 bucks. Okay. So for everyone to take a look at it and see if you're interested in that broad, uh, more copies for those who want to purchase it. So egalitarianism. Egalitarianism is a, a philosophical and political concept in which the notion of equality is highly emphasized upon. It preaches a, a conception of society wherein its members will be entitled to the same rights, same chances, same opportunities, and same outcome. Evidently, this notion has been, has been held as a noble goal to achieve on the premise that individuals of different social classes, uh, different ethnic, racial, religious, and sexual backgrounds will attain a conformed outcome that would benefit everyone. But the question is, what kind of outcome we're looking for? The outcome could differ from various aspects. It could be, it could be material wealth, economic opportunities, or civil rights. <coughs> the redistribution of outcome is the central aim of egalitarianism. Most societies are seeking to fulfill that aim. Omit the Anglo-Saxon liberalism in theory, which clearly value values the individual over, over the collective. The liberalism of continental Europe, led by France and Germany, is a liberalism that values the collective over the individual to an extent. When we observe the way in which politics is conducted and conveyed in continental Europe, we would rightly assume that the United States, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom are very much individualistic, classically liberal, and somewhat minarchist societies. This is, of course, in theory. By minarchist, I mean a society in which the state has a very minimal role in the life of the citizen playing, a role restricted to its primary and most elemental functions. Indeed, the essence of Anglo-Saxon liberalism is limited government and economic freedom. Anglo-Saxon liberalism is based upon the theory of constraining the power of the state in order to leave individuals free to pursue the, the self-interest. Politics in continental Europe is grounded on egalitarianism. European governments are very much unrestrainedly intrusive, significantly aggrandized, relentlessly approaching, redundantly infringing, and heavily centralized. 
For example, social studies in France is highly influenced by the French government. For a person to become a civil servant in France, basically to serve in the government, that person must, must attend the best public institutions such as Sciences Po, LENA, which means in French the um, Ecole of Ecole Nationale d'Administration, so the what National Administration School, or the National School of the Judiciary. In order to be among the next lot of bureaucrats that will rule the country, it is the standard that the French government has imposed upon French society for anyone who wishes to elevate himself in the French social hierarchy. Of course, it does not mean that someone who has not attended these schools cannot become a civil servant. But it would be tremendously difficult, if not impossible, for that person to make it to the, to the French government without attending these schools. Except for Nicolas Sarkozy, who was the exception to that rule, all the president of the French republics have been to those public elite schools that I just mentioned. Another example could be mentioned about the Swedish government, which is one of the largest welfare states in the world. I'm sorry. Social industries such as education, health, or housing are under direct supervision of the Swedish government. European governments are by no means the only government that seek egalitarian ends. Nearly most governments in the world seek, seek to achieve that end, whether it is in South America, Africa, Asia, or Oceania. Even in countries with limited governments such as the United States, Japan, or Mexico, egalitarianism is today preached as the new world order, the new mission to complete, and the new destination to reach. The problem with making egalitarianism an end is that equality can only be enforced or strengthened if the state is used as the great equalizer. And for the state to be used as a great equalizer, it means that it has to inform conformity, which means it will create more inequalities. How so? The state, first of all, deprives the haves of the good and property to give it to the have-nots. When the have-nots receive something that they have not worked for, it generates a sentiment of unhealthy entitlement that even precludes the have-nots from migrating from the lagging social condition to a more advanced social condition. Egalitarianism favors only the third party, which is the state. It favors those who have the arbitrary power to process the wealth, the wealth transfer from one social class to another, which means the bureaucrats. As a matter of fact, bureaucrats greatly benefit in society that seek egalitarianism as their salvation because they have the power to impose regulations upon the way the transfer of wealth should be conveyed. They are the ones who decide who would, who, who would be receiving those state subsidies benefits. They are the ones who decide how the transfer would be operated and, and under what conditions they have not will enjoy the benefits they receive. Clearly, if they have not are constrained to abide by a set of rules in order to enjoy the benefits that they receive from, from state subsidies programs, it substantiates that they are evidently not free, nor that, they live, nor that the living condition is better. The opposite happens as a matter of fact. They become dependent on, those, on these state subsidies benefits, which disincentivize them to not seek employment and to keep them lagging behind the half. The central idea of egalitarianism rotates around the notion of justice. Justice is the principal element to fix disparities and unfair situations that exist uh, among human beings. Egalitarianism without justice has simply no quintessence, no credible ascendancy on those who believe in it. But the essence of justice is rooted in morality within the scope of egalitarianism. If the quest for justice is to right the wrong, then the wrong must, in the first place, be morally corrupt, distorted, and unacceptable in order for justice to be utilized as the instrument of righteousness. Egalitarianism uses justice as the main tool to solve issues, 
to close loopholes and to narrow inequality gaps. <coughs> in fact, egalitarians reject the fact that natural inequality exists. They reject many factors such as geography, culture, behavior, and personal responsibility as intrinsic part of what makes inequality a normal social condition rather than an abnormal and mythical curse. Egalitarians vehemently deny the fact that personal choices have a tremendous role to play in someone's life when it comes to social elevation. Egalitarians argue that justice is the catalyst to ensure that they have not obtained a fair handout that will enable them to be at least in a better position to compete. Of course, the intention is indisputably genuine. But is it because an intention is genuine, honest, and morally right that it leads necessarily to a positive result? As we surely know, this famous proverb by Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, which says, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, unless a wish to do good is well-processed, assessed, calculating with anticipating the gains and loss of the initiative that is about to be undertaken, <laughs> the intent itself is merely abstract because it does not have concrete evidence that supports its cause. For example, the welfare state, whether it is in America or in England, was created with the best of intentions. Yet the evidence clearly shows that the have-nots are not better off despite the benefits of the welfare state. Receiving un uh, undeserved entitlement has made the have-nots economically and socially lagging and resentful toward the haves, which consequently enlarges the inequality gap between the two. Men were created equal before the law but they were not created equal in outcomes. Individuals are different from each other in skills, talent, abilities, morals, cultural values, and customs. For example, it is explicitly unrealistic to expect that an entry-level employee earns the same wage as an employee who has been working for more than three years at the same company. While the entry-level employee is climbing the ladder by learning a new skill set, the employee that has been already working at the company for three years has a skill set far superior than the entry-level one. Therefore, they cannot have the same salary since the, since the output would be significantly different. This difference is ingrained in the natural social condition of inequality. The reason why individuals are not conformed to one another is because they each bring a different set of elements in life they live and the endeavor they pursue. For example, an artist and a physician cannot have the same approach to the completion of a task. An artist would have a creative, innovative, and imaginative approach to a task that he is about to complete in his endeavor, while the physician would have a more procedural, mechanical, and structural approach in completing his assessment with the patient. A person of Muslim faith and one of Jewish faith may not have the same conception of the world, but can still <coughs> coexist in the same society. They may not be culturally equal, but they are equal before the law. Japanese people may be culturally equal because they have a homogeneous culture, since they all speak the same language, have the same cultural values and customs, and have the same religion. But it does not mean that they are necessarily equal on all platforms. Even in Japan, they are rich and poor, and they are have and have nots. These inequalities are all intrinsic because human societies are based on hierarchical structure and attempting to standardize human beings in something that is not in accordance with the nature of the human condition create unprecedented adversarial outcomes. So the purpose of this book is simply to expound and assess the problem of egalitarianism as a societal goal to be achieved. The general idea of the problem of egalitarianism is to authenticate the impossibility for egalitarianism to prevail as an end in itself in society because human, because human beings are naturally unequal. The book is divided into two parts. The first part entrenches 
uh, the philosophical aspect of egalitarianism. It assesses, it assesses the, the concept of egalitarianism from Karl Marx and John Rawls, who are the two foremost intellectuals in the history of political philosophy to have advocated for a society that would establish egalitarianism as its basis to conduct civil policy. And the second part elaborates on the politics of egalitarianism. It evaluates the difference of uh, the different factors that constitute an egalitarian society and why egalitarianism as a political objective will always be a failure. Thank you very much. Okay. Gentlemen, we will have that sound taken care of in a minute. All right, we're, we're taking questions now? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, does somebody want to moderate it? Can you just uh, point the people you? Justin, do you Justin, want to moderate? Justin, you know, a moderator? Do I want to moderate? Sorry. Right. Okay. And you can ask the first question. I'm going to ask the first question. It's fine. It's not new for uh, libertarians to attack egalitarianism. Uh, Rothbard, Freeman, Rand have done so. But most people who don't discuss, most people don't discuss political philosophy. And I'm willing to bet most people define egalitarianism uh, in a colloquial sense, meaning equality before the law or basic human dignity. Do you think attacking quote unquote egalitarianism does harm to libertarian philosophy, portraying it as heartless, cold, risk attracting illiberal and bigoted elements into the movement? Uh, no, so it's important to uh, it's important to set definitions straight. So as I said, egalitarianism <coughs> is seeking an outcome, but it depends on the outcome. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily uh, outcome of income, so everyone has the same wage. It depends. Like let's say for instance the civil rights movement. It was an egalitarian goal that was achieved. It was to have for people to have political rights. So for black people to have political rights as white people. So that was an egalitarian um, goal that, that was sought. So it depends. So it's always an outcome that people are seeking, but what outcomes we're talking about. So if we're talking now about um, economic opportunities, so for people to have e economic opportunities, it doesn't mean that the state has to step in. Let me give you an example. So let's say you take two families, um, a low-income family and a family that is kind of well off. The low-income family at dinner, what they talk about is oh, sports and entertainment. And the, the family that is kind of well off, they talk about science, biology, and uh, education. And both kids at those, at those um, dinners who are taking part of the dinner, they both apply to, I don't know, Harvard or UPenn. And they take the SAT. Who do you think will do better? Who do you think will those schools do better? Because, those, because these kids, they be growing, you know, with the parents at, at going to dinner every night and speaking about a set of topics. But you see the kids who is talking about sports and football and you have the other kid talking about biology and education and information. So if both of them are applying to a school, the one that talks to his parents about education most of the time have, has a higher chance to, to, to get accepted to the school. Do they have the, the same opportunity? Yes. But how you now take care of that opportunity, that's where the difference is. <laughs> All right, who's got questions? Karina. Uh, <coughs> um, at the same company and a man and a woman have the identical position, is it okay to pay the man more than you pay the woman? <laughs> of course it's not okay. Of course not. It is, however, um, it's a matter of private property. So if you're working for a private company and you realize that, not you personally, but you know, as a woman, like you realize that your co-worker, you guys are doing the same exact thing and he's getting paid more than you. You can have a discussion with your boss. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, one full time guys. You can have a discussion with your boss and then see what he's saying about it. I'm going to take my own example. I used to work at Apple. I was paid basically $17 an hour and I have one of my friends, I'm not going to say her name, but we had the exact same position. She was paid 19. We we're doing the exact same thing. She told me a salary. So Apple is a private company. So if so basically if you work for a private company, if you disagree with the way you're paid compared to your 
co-worker who you guys are doing the same thing, but because of maybe the difference of sex, he has an advantage over you. I think that it's fair, first of all, to speak to your boss about it, and if now the boss is being dismissive about the issue, maybe you can take legal action. Yes. All right. The, the, uh, the student body at colleges are uh, at, at medical schools are predominantly white females. Do you think there should be affirmative action for white males? I don't believe in affirmative action. I believe well, they do. in... All these liberals do. <laughs> no, no, I, I believe that... Um, I, I believe that uh, the individual should use his skills and apply, basically apply to the school, and then if, for some reason, his academic standards do not match the school, well, he, he or she cannot get it. <coughs> I don't think that affirmative action necessarily help people. Uh, you, sir. Thanks. Was it Jesse? Yeah. So Jesse was asking, does it hurt their libertarian cause by making you seem like you don't care or you mean? Wouldn't you say that the approach to disproving the, the, the values of egalitarianism is to twofold to show that it's not really fair, like making every forcing things to be equal is not fair, but also show all the evidence that it, even, it doesn't work even if you try it. So okay, they tried it here, and look how after a period of time, those results, results that you force to be equal don't end up to be equal because people work differently, choose to do things differently, and things of that nature. Isn't that the way to avoid sounding like you're not, you know, you mean that you're careless. So, um, yeah. So, uh, is that... Is uh, that a question? Is that like a question or is more like a supportive that, statement? That, do you think that that's the way to, to counter his argument? Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much. So, like, yeah, pretty much. So, like, it's not that when you, when someone is arguing against egalitarian means that he's careless. No. It's just that the best way to give hands out, hand out to people is by using the community. Like, let's do things together, rather than, for instance, using the, uh, public assistance. Because we all use, I mean, we, we all receive handouts at some point in our lives. I mean, no one was born with all the means to achieve the ends he wants in life. At some point, we have people who have helped us. But I think that direct assistance is better because you also built a personal relationship with the person who is helping you rather than the state. You don't build a relationship with the state. It's more like a transaction. And you have to abide by the rules that they impose on you, otherwise you don't get what, what you're looking for. All right, who's next? Okay, I have thought about this a long time, and I think there's a difference between equality and equal opportunity. One person may be a better mechanic, another person a better artist, another person a better musician, but we should all have the equal opportunity to fulfill ourselves, okay? And I notice, I'm old enough, I'm now retirement age. Back in the day, it seems like white males were on the conveyor belt and the rest of us weren't. Now, affirmative action is, as I see it, a temporary, and it, I emphasize temporary, remedy towards that. You have doctors who have no idea that they don't listen to black patients as hard as they listen yeah, to white question? patients. What's and your you question? have early... What's your question? Okay, my, it's a, more of a comment. My early... If you have a comment, no, you have no, a whole no, like five minutes later on. Okay, to, uh, all right. Your question? Yeah, okay. All right, uh, Dave. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> If a man owns a TV repair shop and I bring in a television to be repaired and he repairs it and he says that'll be $39.95 and I say, what? How do you figure charging me this much money? Excuse me. The guy can say to me, look, pal, that's the price and if you don't like it, then it's too bad. But. If a woman owns a television repair shop, and the same to you, if a woman owns a television repair shop, and a man comes in to get it repaired, and she says that'll be $39.85, and he says, how much? Where do you get off wanting this kind of money? Because she's a woman, I mean, she may be beaten down into lowering the price. 
So what's your question? So the question, <laughs> thank you. So the question is that egalitarianism it really does not justify prices, doesn't it just un work to undermine uh, the free market? Uh, I think yes, it does, because if you take it on the economic aspect, egalitarianism basically, it's, you know, the government steps in to regulate things so that people can have equal access to resources. That's the that's the basis. Here. And when the government steps in, it steps. It doesn't just step in to regulate things. It imposes regulations on 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 everyone, and those regulations in uh, include uh, the control of prices. And when the government try attempts to control prices, it, uh, it actually distorts the natural system of command of the market. It distorts the laws of the market, and that's and that's where the issue is. All right. Question, anybody else have it? Charlie. Yeah, German law, if you lived in Plymouth in 1620, and they said, we're going to have this uh, event next week for Thanksgiving, uh, I guess you would say, no thanks. I don't believe in uh, egalitarianism, and uh, I don't want to share my food uh, with any Indians. Is that your question to him? But would you uh, would you uh, not partake in Thanksgiving, or would you just eat at home in your own cabin? No, I'd be with family, not in my own cabin. In your own cabin? No, with my family. family. <laughs> no, no, it's in my own cabin. I don't know. Wait, there's only two things. You can be in your own cabin. No, I would be with my family. <laughs> well, so where's the family your family then? They live separately. <laughs> there's a Thanksgiving event. Mm -hmm. So where are you? I'm saying I'm going to be with my family. Like, you know, where so are I'm they? Why does it matter to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, so I is the question, curious. is the question, are you going to be dining? Like, yeah, this question doesn't relate really to what I thought. I you just want to be a, a, a as usual. All right, is there any, <laughs> Thank you, any, any other first questions, sir? Sir, you touched on this earlier, but how does egalitarianism work in terms of the trades where Somebody, like you said, who just started out is going to be paid the same as someone who's senior. How, how, does, how, how does that work out? Because we have, in my trade, that kind of system. So how, how does that play into that? No, so basically, the example I gave earlier was that when you do a job, at the end of the day, you do not have the exact same salary over a long time period. You start with whatever salary, and then eventually it could it increase. But for the other people who are also working in your company, their salary will also increase too. So my point is that things can never, like wages can never be equalized. If, if I'm answering your question, and let maybe, I mean, if I'm, if I'm answering your question, my point is that wage can never be equalized because salary always increase for everyone who's working in the company. Yes. Sir. So if a company were to hire a male and a female, both did the same job, and the female were to get paid less, why wouldn't a business owner only hire females? Well, <laughs> why do business owner only hire females? Because, because they're paying they're paying the females less. Why wouldn't they only hire females then? Because um, the government has imposed on businesses the fact that you cannot discriminate. So basically companies are they go with the law of hiring the exact amount of people on each um, on each gender, so to prove that there is diversity. But to me, diversity is not based on the physical features; it's based on the skills you have. And if people have different skill set, to me, that's diversity because they bring something to the productivity of the company. Uh, Tim, do you have a question? Well, yeah. Um, going back to your point, does does you know women do have babies and they do have families and they do leave the workplace for quite some time? Wouldn't that kind of be like unequal treatment then for giving somebody preferential leave rather than not? Can you be more specific? Women will get have to take time off from a job. Yeah. We get expect to come back. 
to uh, the same pay to save benefits, they might be out for a year. Okay. But, you know, and you have a man who normally doesn't do that, why should there then be equal pay? Yeah. You mean, you not mean all women have pay? babies. I mean, not all... Wrapped, but... I mean, not all women have babies, that's number one. And number two, uh, each company decide on how much they want to pay for the pay leave. So, as I say, like, if we want to compare male and female, we have to distinguish between the private sector and the public sector too. Because all companies act um, differently when it comes to how much they want to give to the women who are going on leave, whether it's three months or a year. So it really depends. And I know that, I mean, for my friends, for instance, uh -huh. who, have, who have been married and who have been married and they have kids, the wives used to go, they used to get paid for three months. Uh, for, for, at the company they were, they used to get paid for three months. After three months, they have to come back. Okay. If they were not, well, I mean, I guess they, they will not get paid. But there are other companies that will pay you for the entire year. Too. So it really depends which company uh, pays on, and on, the, on, on the length of the, of the leave. Okay. Any other... Yes, uh, oh, yeah. um, you started out talking about France. Yes. What Could you reiterate the point you made about equality in France? Yeah, so basically I was saying that um, in France, uh, the government is very involved in human activity. And the example I gave was uh, to be able to become a civil servant in France, you need, uh, the government basically allocates where you have to go in order to make it to the French government. Person, but we know, if, I, if we compare to the United States, we know that in the U.S., most people who are working for the federal government, they go to Ivy League schools. But the government does not impose on them that if they don't go to these schools, they, not, they cannot make it. But in France, it's basically the case. Like in France, if you do not go to those public elite schools, it will be harder for you to become a civil servant. So it was a way to show that how France has a has its how the gov how the French government has its word to say on how to elevate yourself in the social hierarchy. Uh, any other questions? First round, Adam. Thank you again, Chairman. O. Loud, uh, please. And thank you, Justin, for moderating. Uh, to clarify, Mr. Paydock's unusual question and redirect it. I'm going to ask, if you hypothetically lived 400 years ago in New England and your Puritan neighbors wanted to have uh, a celebratory meal after the harvest uh, with their Wampanoag neighbors, uh, you know, down the road or down the trail, even if you didn't go yourself, would you be opposed to their celebratory harvest festival meal? As a voluntary not. exercise. No, why would I? It doesn't, I mean, yeah. it doesn't infringe my rights, so no. I mean, they can do whatever they want. I think you, I was taking notes earlier, but I missed some of the, some, you gave the French example and something about the Swedish example. And then no, I was saying that when it comes to social industries yeah. in Sweden, such as, you know, healthcare, education, and housing, yeah. the government has direct control over those industries. So it was to show that how um, government is intrinsically involved in in the liberal aspect in in Europe, in continental Europe, compared to the U.S. or uh, English-speaking countries. All, All right. right. Uh, anybody who has not asked a question yet want to ask a question? All right. We'll go with second round of question. We'll go with George. All right. What do you think of the stigma on minorities for <coughs> for affirmative action? The stigma on minorities. Uh, I know affirmative action is pretty much gone, but they still do it. But when you say the stigma, what do you exactly... Well, they feel that they're good enough, they need preferential government, and they feel they have self-doubt. Yeah, but, so, the thing is that, why bother is it because it's like petting them, saying like, oh, we feel bad for you, we're going to like push you a little bit so that you can do it. I don't think that's the way to help someone. I don't think, like, that's the... That's, yeah, I don't think it's a way to help someone. As I said, like I rather apply to a small school, right, and know that I will finish at the top of my class there than applying to a big schools and finish at the bottom. And 
because if for instance like I have I don't know like a 2.3 GPA and I'm, I'm applying to Harvard and I have like a I don't know, 690 score at the SAT. I'm applying to Harvard and they still pick me, although my academic credentials are lower than what Harvard expects. What does it mean? It means that they did not accept me based on what I intellectually worth. They accept me simply based on the fact that they need to diversify the, the, the student body color-wise. And it, it will not help me becoming a better student because I'm just going to Harvard. There's no guarantee that because I'm there, I'm going to become a better student. As I said, I'd rather go to a small school, put the work, and finish at the top of my class. Then I know that, yes, I work harder than being at the big schools, and I'm at the bottom. There's still a stigma on, on uh, <coughs> affirmative action. I'm annoyed. Yeah. All right, Tim. All right, Germano, what prompted you? I mean, I know you're talking about egalitarianism and everything else. Why did you write the book? I mean, was there a, a specific reason or event in your life that that caused the writing of this book or a story behind it at all? Yeah, so the story was that uh, I was watching um, a free to choose from Milton Friedman, uh, episode five, it's called Created Equal. So they show a little bit uh, what Milton Friedman talks about for like 30 minutes and then all the professors and all the scholars gathered in the room and they discuss the ideas. And Thomas Sowell was explaining, he was among the scholars that were, that were participating in the, in the debate, and he was explaining how um, egalitarianism doesn't help people. How it doesn't help people because, and how it doesn't even help societies overall, because by focusing on egalitarianism, he was saying that um, government measures, or they measure opportunity by outcome. So that theory that Thomas Sowell talked about, I actually developed it in the book. So basically measuring, um, so measuring opportunity by outcome means that based on what the outcome will be, you allocate opportunities accordingly. But the problem is that there is no guarantee that that outcome will actually be exactly the way you expect it. And that's why uh, economies like the Soviet Union end up failing, because they, they make plans on a long-term basis and they allocate um, they try to allocate resources based on on those plans but it ends up not working out because there was a factor that was not part of the part of the plan that came into play it's coming honey so it's it completely because... distorts uh the entire the entire movie but so, but couldn't it be said that egalitarianism is not the cause because i always thought that what you're describing was a direct result of no price control mechanisms. I mean, of, of, of price control mechanisms and a planned economy, rather than egalitarianism. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Planned economy based on egalitarianism because they, they measure opportunity by outcome. Because their goal is to equalize things. That's the thing. And based on that equalization they try to achieve, they try to allocate opportunities on how they're going to equalize. That's, that's my theory. Uh, yeah, and, and, and as a corollary, you are familiar with the with the, with F, with Hayek's uh, the road to serfdom, correct? Yes. And because a lot of what you're talking about is exactly what he talked about in thirty and in, in forty five. Yeah, forty five. Yeah. I even even the book I made um, I, I I made a uh, uh, and I, I give an example talking about how they measure opportunity by outcome. When you look at for instance housing. You know, I make it. It was a uh, fictitious example. So let's say in Los Angeles there are like 2,000 um, homeless, right? So, and the, the government of Los Angeles decide to um, decide to build housing, and they have like special units for people to get it. But in order to get into those housing, you need to work. Although you don't make a lot of money, the point is that you still need to have some income so that the government can take some fees some taxes from that income. So what does he make? The 2,000 homeless, they still can make it. So they still stay on the street. So it's people who are working part-time that will be getting into those housing. And on top of that, they're still allocating um, opportunities by, for instance, saying like you need to have like only one child in order to make it if you have two child, uh, two, two uh, children, you have to, to pay extra fees, so we have to tax you more and stuff like that. So it doesn't equalize. It doesn't, um, it doesn't alleviate the burden of those who need it the most, who are the homeless. Because when you do um, 
public housing is for people who have bad housing or no housing to be able to make it, and they're still on the street because they don't have any, they don't have any income. So that, so that was one example I gave in the book to explain how, by trying to use uh, egalitarianism, so by trying to equalize uh, opportunities, you actually create more inequalities for those who actually need it. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, Jeremiah, I seem to read that you say that egalitarianism is wrong, it won't work, but uh, cultural anthropologists and sociologists uh, have determined there are 156 Native American tribes that inhabited the North American continent, and each and every one of them practiced egalitarianism in terms of sharing food and material goods such What's as the health. question? Let me finish, please. Sharing hides to ensure that everyone, every every family in the tribe had a warm teepee to live in. And it existed for hundreds of years and benefited those people. And not to say that it won't work. These are promised to is, is, what place is, that's not the information that I've got. So what was the question? Well, what do you, how do you mean it won't work? How do you mean it does not work? What did you look at? Well, I look at um, societies that actually use egalitarianism, such as uh, countries that were previously socialist, and the fact that they were sharing, they were sharing everything together, did not actually help those that were at the bottom of society. And I've said earlier that when you look at the former Soviet Union. Um, the people that were rich in the Soviet Union were people of the Politburo. They were those, the politicians uh, working for the government, and the rest were all poor. And it was basically the same in all Eastern Europe. So if egalitarianism, so if egalitarianism as a goal uh, could be achieved, those countries would have never lived socialism or communism as their uh, political and economic system. Follow up. Let's no, uh, we got. No, we'll no, no. Wait a minute. We got time. Don't be a tyrant. Tell me. Yeah, we know, Charlie. What don't be a tyrant. What are the? What is evidence of egalitarianism in Russia under the Tsar? What are examples of egalitarianism under the Tsar? Yeah. There wasn't any. Did, did he? I don't recall German claiming there was. Mike. Well, must have been better on the bizarre, right? So, uh, <laughs> there, there is natural evidence. There is natural evidence that human uh, beings, whether they be families, whether it be tribes or small nations, actually organize themselves in hierarchies. Okay. So what you're saying is that human beings collectively will form natural hierarchies. In other words, there's always the phrase the alpha male, right, and those at the bottom. And my question is, do you think that that is applying to all, all races, all tribes, yeah, everywhere? Yeah, everywhere. Or is I mean, if, if, even in the family unit, like, you know, you have... And they're not egalitarian. Egal, 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 all right, okay. You mean egalitarian, like if it applies in right. every... Right, so it's hierarchical. It's hierarchical instead yeah, of I mean, even among families and tribes. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay. it applies everywhere. Like, even in the family unit, you have... Uh, dad, mom, and then you have the oldest child, the second oldest, and you know it goes. So like, there is no strict equality among everyone else. Like, you have to basically work your way up. You may have. Yeah, I have a question this time. Isn't in the old Soviet Union wasn't the problem that the inequality and the wealth of the public bureau members versus everybody else was due to a lack of check and checks and balances because they affect kind of an authoritarian system? Actually, yes. There was a lack of check and balance, definitely. Because the Politburo mm -hmm. decided uh, whatever life should be in the Soviet Union and in the rest of Eastern Europe. So in the Soviet Union, basically, in order to be successful, you have to be approved by the Politburo. You have or to be a member of the Politburo. Yeah, right. exactly. Otherwise, 
So if you become like a lawyer or a doctor there, you're not a doctor on your own or you don't work in for a private company. Well, like the lack of checks and balances, such as freedom of speech, freedom to assemble, all our First Amendment freedoms, wasn't that a, a major cause of that? Inequality? Yeah, no, definitely. It was, it, no, it was definitely part of it, but it was mainly economically in the first place. Because uh, the Soviet Union tried to um, to do an arm race with the United States, a nuclear arm race, and they didn't have enough. <laughs> they didn't have enough to compete, and they completely stagnated their economy. All right, uh, Karina. Um, what's a better school uh, philosophy, the American school system or the baccalaureate European school system? Should we make sure that all students go to an equal school or schools that provide equal quality education? I mean, I personally grew up in the baccalaureate system, and I personally like it better because uh, it's a system in which if you fail, the professor will not make you pass. You fail, you have to restart. So it forces you to actually work. Like in, in the American education system, in my opinion, like, Professors have to, they have to pay students because students are seen as customers, to be honest. They're seen as customers and uh, students do not, uh, I don't think they put their entire value in the, in the school system compared to the baccalaureate in which I grew up. But I would not also say that the U.S. should use the baccalaureate European system because the systems are different. In the U.S. system, uh, parents decide what education they want for their kids, and it's not for the state to impose a specific um, curriculum on people. All right, uh, other second questions? Adam? Stand up. Following up on that, uh, when it comes to a comparison of educational policies and outcomes, uh, between the Anglo-Saxon democracies and continental Europe. Um, if you could maybe elaborate further, if you know this, what is the percentage of people who complete the sort of advanced no, baccalaureate high okay, school education finished? versus others who sort of they don't make it that far and end up going to a different track to trade school or something like that? And uh, added to that, at the university level, to what degree the social democratic countries in Europe, are they subsidizing upper middle class people to go through their colleges versus actually bringing in people from non-college educated families? Yeah, so, you know those yeah, so basically like, you know, in, 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 in the US and generally in Anglo-Saxon countries, after high school they give you the opportunity to basically, you know, take another path, whether it's straight school or sales. But in Europe usually, it's not that area is not wide, so people have to go to they have to go to college, and the government kind of compel them to, but the government gives them incentive to do so because if they go, this is the reward that they will have at the end. But in the U.S., like, since people are free, they're saying that we're not going to force you to go to college if you don't want to, so long as you know how to do it to take care of yourself, so how to become successful. So that's why, for instance, like, as I said, like trade and sales in the U.S., it's like the third path for people. You know, it's like you know what? I was I was never in high school. I don't want to waste my money in college. Like I'm not interested in it. I'm just gonna do sales or I'm gonna create a business and work for it. Even if you look at um, the, even if you look at economic opportunities in the U.S. compared to Europe. It's very hard for people, for immigrant persons, to leave their countries of origin and go to Europe and become millionaires or billionaires because Europe doesn't allow that compared to the U.S. In the U.S., you can, you can, if like you're from Africa, you can dare to leave whatever you have and come to the U.S. You have no education and you decide to work your butt off and make it. There are many examples of that in the, in the United States. All right, uh, any other second questions? Right there. Sir. Uh, in terms of Scandinavia, sir, where you're right, there is a divide between rich and poor, they still see themselves as egalitarian. How does that dichotomy work? So it's important to understand that 
their system, first of all, is different because they have a different conception than us. Us, we, we, uh, we base our system on John Locke. So, you know, you have to let the individual free from the government, let him do his thing and stuff like that. In, in Scandinavia, it's even written in the constitution that it is the role of the government to take care of certain things for them. They want that. That is why egalitarianism works uh, works a little better there. But it's not even a goal, it's just a means to help everyone. That is why. Because in Scandinavia, everyone participates. There's, in most Scandinavian countries, there's no minimum wage. So you have to bargain with your boss about how much he's going to pay you. There's a reason for that. Because everybody in, in Scandinavian countries contribute to the economy one way or another. That's why the government gives them that service back and say you have free healthcare, you have free stuff. And that's why it, it works pretty efficiently. And on top of that, each of these countries have less than 10 million inhabitants. So when you have less people in one place, it's kind of, it's a little easier to collectivize things compared to a place like the United States where you have 300 million. So when people always compare Scandinavian and US, like if you want to compare things, at least trying to pick the population first, make sure like it's kind of equal to an extent, and then you can compare the living standards. Sorry, small follow-up. China has a billion. Yeah. yeah. Billion and a half, and yet yeah. yeah, they're still trying to collectivize. How, how is that? No, actually, they tried to liberalize. Yes, because under Mao, China was a completely collectivist society and the economy was not doing well. So once Mao died, um, Deng Xiaoping liberalized the economy. So that's when uh, people were, not, were able to have access to private property in China and they can basically rise. Uh, any other second questions? We can go for a third round, George. Well, uh, it, it, yeah. well in, the, in the 1960s, blacks used to say they cannot be racist because they have no power. What do you think of that? I didn't agree with it. So, what is racism to begin with? Racism is it's a collective thought that a group of people think that they are, they are superior, they are racially superior than others. The problem with racism is that why people legitimize it? They legitimize it with slavery and colonization. But uh, racism is not a one-way street. You have whites who hate blacks, you have blacks who hate whites. And you have Chinese who hate whites. And you have whites who hate Asians. So it's everywhere. Slavery was everywhere. Colonization was everywhere. You have, you have two groups who look alike. I mean, they have like the same racial, uh, they have the same skin color, and it's to colonize each other. In Africa, it was through tribalism. In Asia, in Far East Asia, it was also through tribalism. Europe, which is the continent that, the continent of war, colonize, Europeans colonize each other on a regular basis. So when it comes to um, racism itself, it's not just a one which is not um, white people who, are, who, are, who uh, hate blacks and black cannot be racist because they don't have the power. It's not that. Racism is just, is, is just a group of people thinking that they're racially superior than others. Some black people believe that they're racially superior than whites happens. So when you have like um, black supremacy, it's the same thing as white supremacy too. So it's everywhere. Third round, uh, Tim. Doesn't the same thing apply to Cubs versus Sox fans? <laughs> uh, Charlie. It eludes me completely that there's any problem whatsoever with egalitarianism. What a beautiful um, What's the question? That's it eludes me altogether that there's the title of his book is that there's a problem of egalitarianism. The first time I saw it, I said I didn't know there was a problem. If you don't have upward mobility or provisions for upward mobility in a society, I guess terminal, you like feudalism, right? 
Do you like feudalism? Is that the question? Yeah, I'm sorry. No, not feudalism. It's not in y'all. It's going to be a mess. You have to provide yourself with I'm real busy. It's going to be a mess. No, not feudalism. You have to make student loan. All right, third, uh, third, uh, Michael, you had a question? I just want to be tailored to the guy behind me. What would my, what would upward mobility really mean? Let's do a hierarchy there. You know, egalitarian if there was upward mobility. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, is there any other questions? You won't answer on that anyway. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, or Adam, we got Adam. Uh, okay, let's go. Uh, you were talked about uh, public housing controls earlier uh, and public housing programs. And I know that one of the things that characterized a lot of public housing in the United States was that only in many cases <coughs> the lowest income people would go there. There were some counterexamples in parts of Europe, maybe rebuilding after the war, where there were middle earning people living in public housing. But then there were social tensions between them and the lower income people in public housing. If, if you had anything about that in your book or any comments. Oh, no, no. I was mainly focused on, on the US when I was talking about the problem of housing and birth control. All right. I think we're ready to go to rebuttals. All right, rebuttals. Thanks, uh, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, get the count of hands so we can allocate the time. Raise your hand if you want to do a rebuttal. Raise your hand if you want to do a rebuttal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, About five minutes. Five minutes apiece. Let's get up there. We got an open microphone. Start. We got an open mic. If you've got to rebut, rebut. All right, time will be five minutes, Andy. You got a timer ready? Okay. Uh, sir, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your time and your presentation. I really enjoyed it. I, I yeah. love the idea of social strata. I would like to think that egalitarianism would be uh, something that the collective, not only the United States, but the whole planet can do because we're all in this together. We share one planet. We, we have something coming out called the Green New Deal, which a lot of the majority of the planet wants to partake in. They want to, you know, use less, uh, contribute more into society. I, I can only speak for myself as a, a railroad worker, but our contract, I've noticed, I called it when I looked at it very Scandinavian in the sense that no matter if you're a conductor, locomotive engineer, brakeman, the pay is the same rate, and it doesn't matter whether you're a five-year veteran, a 15-year veteran like myself, a 30-year veteran, your pay is exactly the same. So in that very small scale, on that very small level, maybe you're right, maybe egalitarianism is only possible on a small scale, but if everybody's on the exact same small scale collectively, I, I have this pie in the sky idea of like Star Trek where everybody on the planet is all in this together to better the planet because now we're up against the entire universe which is in itself collective you know besides the earth and you, you have you know this whole federation other than planet earth now you're talking this grand scale and here's the you know little earth where there's seven billion ten billion however many are on the planet so why wouldn't this eventually on our scale of technology where we're all getting to know one another, accepting one another, why wouldn't it be possible to one day, soon, have a more of an egalitarian society? And I'll, I'll give you another point of fact, the, the, the one-payer healthcare system. You can be a billionaire, you can be a millionaire, you can make no money at all, yet we all pay into the same system, getting the same, at least in theory, level of healthcare. Wouldn't that be correct, sir? Maybe. But, uh, this would be my ideal of, of collective behavior. Uh, in Canada, Israel, Japan, China, countries that you may or may not have mentioned, you, you have one payer system of health care, and no matter what you make uh, in terms of salary, you, you get the same level of government service. Uh, I'll give you an example here in Chicago, the roads. We all drive on the same roads, assuming we all drive. If you don't drive, you take the L. But you all pay the same fare in L service. No matter if you make millions, billions, or make nothing, the fare is what? 250, right? 225, whatever it is. Isn't that a perfect example of egalitarianism? Public transit? 
bus L, it runs 22, 23, 24 hours a day, and yet here it is, example right before your eyes, if you take the bus that goes down Addison, 152, whatever it is, the pay is the same. If Bill Gates got on the bus, he pays the same as I do. I don't make the same as Bill Gates, but that's egalitarianism. Public transit would be a wonderful example of egalitarianism. I'm sure there's more examples, but yeah, that's one that's ran in efficiently. They stopped the buses at eight o'clock. Very good. Yeah, see, it works. You like public transit? No, we My do. Name's but a, my name is Joe. You probably seen me here before. Louder, um, please. I'm a member of the Libertarian Party, but I'm also a member of a socialist caucus within that party. So I believe in libertarianism and free markets, but I also believe in voluntary socialism. And I think it's important that libertarians and socialists have conversations about egalitarianism, especially the foundations of the libertarian philosophy and John Locke. I think is especially important, so I appreciate the speaker for talking about this stuff. I agree with the speaker and libertarians that it's wrong and requires an act of violence or a threat of extortion and implied violence when the state taxes our money, and especially when it spends it irresponsibly. But the state is inherently based on legitimate violence. And um, when it takes our money and redistributes, no, it's, it's true. Uh, for Barack Obama admitted in a speech that the definition of, of the state is an entity which is capable of wielding a credible monopoly on, uh, on the and legitimized use of, of violence in order to achieve its goals. That is the textbook definition of the state, Charlie. Um, I don't agree with the, redistrib the redistribution of wealth. I don't agree with the redistribution of wealth or the guaranteeing of outcomes. I don't. Also, I also don't agree with the state's protection of property titles or property claims, because the state is a monopoly and it interferes with the free market whenever the state does a minimal government thing of protecting private property. So we can guarantee equality not by having the state enforce a state of equality. We can guarantee equality and guarantee access to land and natural resources by just abolishing the state and saying, hey, listen to John Locke, no one can take more than 4.8 acres per person because then people would have to live on the friggin' water. So there's a way to distribute resources equally just by doing some math and saying, saying to people, you have to limit yourselves, saying to collective enterprises, you can govern yourselves and then we won't need an external central government. We can have to such total freedom of equality of opportunity to compete against monopolists and established enterprises and established property owners that we can eventually run them out of business. That is the kind of total freedom and total equality I think we can achieve, but I don't think we need government forced to do it. Excuse me. Being able to ride the Addison Street bus like anyone else, whether I'm a millionaire or a pulp, is hardly a question of egalitarianism. Uh, the fact is, it was left out that one can always take a cab where the driver will open the door for them and say yes sir and no sir, that sort of thing. So, uh, because I'd be able to take the bus the same as any other peasant is hardly a question of egalitarianism. Um, there are other alternatives. One can drive his own car to work, take a cab, a carpool, and a number of other things. So uh, I think that using an example of a uh, public transportation for egalitarianism really kind of stinks. Why? So. Uh, I got. You want me to buy a car? Uh, do you want to get up here and talk? Is it? Yeah, I want to know why. Yeah, come on, you come up here and you talk. He said I have to go and buy a car. I didn't you say. Did I say that? Yeah. No, I did not. Now, okay, sucks. come on. You want to make an argument, and you want to do this, then you come up and you do it. I'll go ahead and abstain. Go ahead. You get. You go on up there and do it. 
out there and be in the dark. Yeah, people can't even afford bus fare, man. Where's your head? Next, please. Next. We got an open mic up here. See, you can't even get up there and talk because you're going to have some goof. Uh, you got three uh, hassles left. David, David, Charlie, is that David Charlie. That's right. You still have three and a half minutes left if you want to back up later. <laughs> All right. No, because I keep getting uh, antagonized. Okay. Okay, this is my first time back in about 25 years. I used to go, go to the college uh, in the old, old days before I moved out of town. Uh, the issue here is egalitarianism, egalitarianism. And there are two ways of defining it, equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Now it's impossible to produce equality of outcome, even though some countries do try. Uh, for the majority of North Koreans, the peasants, if you're not in the government, there is a quality of outcome. In other words, you're impoverished and starving. Same in Venezuela and Cuba. The political structure, in Soviet terms, nomenclatura, determines who has the privileges and who has a quality of misery. Now, somebody spoke about voluntary socialism. I think they claim to be a libertarian, but uh, the thing is, if voluntary socialism really worked, North Korea would be a very prosperous nation. So would Cuba, so would Venezuela. You're saying those are voluntary regimes? No, they're not voluntary at all. The state enforces the social strata in those nations, and you either suffer like everyone else, try to flee the state, in which case you're likely to be shot in the back, or starve to death. So there's nothing really voluntary about socialism. Now the notion of the command economy is that the state dictates what is produced and how much. It doesn't matter what the quality or lack thereof is, but, uh, you know, uh, whatever bureaucrat produces the most in shoddy goods, that's a bonus. It doesn't matter that uh, these goods are unmarketable or des undesired or unusable, but, uh, you know, you're judged on what you produce in quantity, not in quality. There's a story that uh, during the Soviet Union, they did an experiment. They were short on uh, something that might have been ball bearings, I don't know what. But they decided to issue uh, a piecework uh, deal. You know, you got so much for each item you produced. And all of a sudden, people started <coughs> producing in quantity and earning real wages. Government didn't like that, so they abolished that. Everyone got the same wages, irrespective of whether they produced much or produced very little. And in those types of economies, you know, there's no market competition. You know, there's, there's one type of product in each uh, area, be it food, cars, whatever. And uh, as there's no competition, there's no competition to produce quality. So in summation, socialism doesn't work. It's not voluntary, it's only effective when the government backs it up with force. Now, as to the, the whole health care debacle, there are countries that do have single-payer health plans. In Canada, you know, the government taxes you and pays for your health care. 
It may take you six months to get an MRI and maybe two years to get major surgery. That's why a lot of Canadians go south of the border for their health care for major <coughs> operations and so forth. Now, uh, it's been estimated that under uh, Senator <coughs> Warren's health plan, it would cost taxpayers $52 trillion to provide universal health care for all Americans. We're already $22 trillion in debt, which is growing larger by the day, so there's no telling how long this could go on before the United States goes bankrupt. The better remedy is provide consumer choice. Some people prefer a government option. Some people prefer uh, private insurance through their uh, employers or retirement plans. Let every individual decide for themselves what works best for themselves. It's all about making choices and having the ability to choose what you perceive is best for you. Thank you. Okay. Next rebutter, please. Next rebutter, please. <laughs> All right, Andy. See, I wouldn't play this game, so now I got it. If you were watching, uh, Outer Andy. Anybody that was watching television at, at daytime or night in the last two weeks, there's a few things that people are talking about that they weren't talking about before, like. One major fact is the cat's out of the bag about what we have is a psychopathic criminal masquerading as our president. And that's being talked about in exactly those terms. And one Galileo was threatened to be burned at the stake because he was forced with the knowledge that the church didn't want to hear. Well, today, it's common knowledge. Today, you don't have to worry about getting assassinated if you break news that their tobacco industry had reports showing that tobacco uh, smoking caused lung cancer. Right after 9-11, if you were talking about the anthrax mailings and you knew anything about it, you were among one of the 26 people that got killed because they knew where the anthrax came from. It came out of Fort Detroit. It wasn't done by Osama bin Laden with the anthrax mailings. But now, 20 years later, there's not so much risk about talking about that. Well, now that we have some common sense injected into our Congress, uh, many people are speaking out and they're not so afraid of getting attacked by Trump and his minions because the world is looking at, they're not looking at Trump, the world is looking at us, millions of people, and saying, how do you tolerate bully, coward, liar, thief, and psychopath with no qualifications for that office at all, how have you tolerated this for three years as a country? Ralph Nader, I, I used to think Ralph Nader didn't have it right when he said we only have one political party, one party in this country. It has two faces, but it's a corporate party. When we get tired of one face, they give us the other face. But the main corporate agenda keeps going on and on and on. This last two weeks, gave us the best demonstration. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Well, a working model is worth a thousand pictures. Mitch McConnell has given us the exact dictionary definition of the word evil. Look up the word evil in the dictionary and there should be a picture of Mitch McConnell <laughs> right next to Dick Cheney. Those two people just emanate evil. Moscow Mitch. It, it, uh, they, you know, they, if you listen to uh, right-wing uh, talk radio, Sean Hannity said that last two weeks ago, he says, Nixon was impeached because he lied to Congress. Bill Clinton was impeached because he lied to Congress. Trump has never lied to anybody. Why are they picking on him? <laughs> he said, he said That's that? the closest thing. The last two there, weeks is the closest thing you're seeing to basically highly paid, highly skilled, highly educated 
intellectual prostitutes that are paid to stand up there with their right hand up and say, Your Honor, I swear to God, the earth is flat. Trust me. The only kind of bald-faced lie we didn't hear coming out of the Republicans that are paid to lie to us was the earth is flat. The Flat Earth Society just had a convention in <coughs> Dallas. Yeah, and the Flat Earth Society is like... Um, Rock grant, uh, you know, what, what do you call it? A, uh, uh, some kind of a cult. They do this just for, for laughs, but it, never mind. Don't get distracted. Uh, how many of you know that a hunger strike started in our Congress this week? Tim knows. Who knows about, who can tell us about the hunger strike that's going on right now? Is there? It's in it's zero because they're blacking it out. The, the group of kids that are protesting for their future, millions of them now, one group called Extinction Rebellion started a sit-in, a hunger strike in Nancy Pelosi's office. And these, that group, there's hunger strikes going on in cities all over the world because they said even after talking about climate for several months since Greta sailed over here, governments still aren't doing anything. And so the media... You know, it's, it's going to take massive mobilization. There's a new book out. Uh, you can get it at Barnes and Noble, Amazon. Read or wrote it. It's called No One Is Too Small to Make a Difference. That's the title of that book. No One Is Too Small to Make a Difference. It's a little $10 book and it's brilliant. There's another one called Common Sense, an upgrade of Thomas Paine's book. Common Sense for the 21st Century. That's put out by one of the founders of Extinction Rebellion. I'll have more, I'll have copies of that next week for anybody that wants one. But in any case, we have our hands full. We have to speak truth to power, and we have to help people understand that they're living in the cult of Trump. It's like a religious cult. People believe things that aren't real. And the world, the country is waking up, and we're beginning to approach the rest of the world looking at what has to be done if, if these kids and grandkids are going to have any future at all beyond the 26th. Thank you very much. All right. Don't drink the Kool-Aid of renewables. All right, you're going to speak or do you want me to go next? Come on next, Tim. Who's the next uh, the water? Let's get, a, get up there. Guy. What is it this week? Uh, everybody, they're there. They're, 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 no, they do understand. All right, thank you uh, to Chairman All. I thought it was an interesting presentation. I believe in one of his previous visits here, I mentioned in my rebuttal and something I sort of hinted at in my question. Uh, something that struck me, I'd read this under Spiegel, their English edition from a few years ago, that uh, even though they have heavily subsidized university uh, attendance in Germany, over three quarters of the students are from families that already attended college. So it's not really bringing in anyone from the, or it's bringing in less than one quarter of the students from the German working class or and or from families that, where the parents have not attended university. Uh, and something I'd read several years earlier, uh, this may not be how French universities are now, but that part of the crisis in the spring of 1968 was that when the university tuition, I believe, was again covered by the taxpayer, but then what did they do? Well, we've got to limit the number of people that we keep, so they gave them really harsh exams every semester of the first two years to try and flunk them out because, yeah, it's socialized, but it's also rationed. They weren't going to make it easy for you to stay at the Sorbonne or the and University and of Nanterre. That's when we we're socializing things. You always have to, to, to ration things right. so everyone can do um, In the case of the British public Thank housing, you. this was something I know through the even the years before Thatcher came to power, because they had such a large stock of British public housing where it wasn't just necessarily the lowest income people in Britain living in it, the people who were somewhat more affluent members of the working class or you know, middle class who lived in public housing said, great, now when do I get to buy my unit? Because I don't want to just live in a crumbling tower somewhere. If I'm in a small brick house in a row, I want to be able to buy my unit. And the Labor Party wouldn't budge on this for years, and countless Labor Party politicians have said, 
that might have saved them from losing to Thatcher at the end of the 70s and not regaining power until the end of the 90s when Tony Blair won on a program that would not challenge the right for them to have kept the public housing they'd already bought. Um, and those are just ordinary citizens, again, buying it, uh, not real estate developers. Um, I don't want to uh, oppose the idea uh, of climate change or the need for us to address climate change, but my wife, who uh, voted green many times in her life and, uh, and is a supporter of many environmental policies well to the left of me, she's not guilty of anything with the Libertarian Party. Uh, every time we drive down Ravenswood, can't get through because they've been working on some of the overpasses for years, it really makes me wonder, how well would we do with a committed effort to transform the world in 12 years if they can't even finish Foster and Ravenswood in the last five, or Winnemac and Ravenswood, or Balmoral and Ravenswood in the last five? It's pathetic. That is the public sector that we'd be placing our trust in. Does this mean that my daughter may be facing a planet where the human population is dying out? Yeah, and that makes me really sad. Uh, but these are the exemplars of government in action uh, that we have seen. On a slightly different angle, Charlie, under the old system in Russia, under the Tsar, in that gap of about 50 or 60 years between the emancipation of the serfs and the Bolshevik Revolution, the peasant commune, the Mir system, the Obshina system, that made a big comeback, so that by the time of the revolution, uh, the aristocrats owning the big landed estates was actually down to, at least according to one historian, Dominic Levin, below, I think, like 20, per, below 20 percent. It was low. It was the old order had become very weak by the time of the revolution. And that would have come back in the Zemstvo councils and the villages where they divvy up the land each year. But as you may know from the European style peasant cultivation, these aren't contiguous farms like in the U.S. So it's like, well, I have one vegetable plot here and then a half kilometers walk that way, I have my next plot, and then another one a couple miles that way. So there was a sort of egalitarian spirit, but it was not great at a economic accumulation. Um, now, we don't have to fetishize economic accumulation, but that's the difference between the sort of um, pre-industrial egalitarianism you're talking about uh, in pre-Columbian America versus an industrial socialist egalitarianism, egalitarianism based on central planning and equality of outcomes and trying to achieve that sort of thing. Uh, and last but not least, as a teaser for the talk, I'm going to give Janusz Kornai talked about this in one of his books, even the idea of, I'm not even talking about social equality, this is an economist I'm giving a presentation on in a couple of weeks, but the idea of equilibrium in an economy between different sectors. Economies always change, so there's never really a point where you can say, ah, the industry will be just this big, and agriculture will be just that big, and white-collar workers will stay just this much a percentage of the economy. It would be frozen. It always changes. Anyway, I ran on a little long. Sorry about that. Thanks, everyone. We all talk about the problems of egalitarianism and what system we'd like to live under. But let's face facts. We're all here. We all live under what we call a capitalistic or perhaps maybe mercantilistic system that we have in the United States of America. And I'm not going to sit here and say that one is better than the other. I'm going to simply say that when a country is more capitalist, it tends to do better. The downside of capitalism is something called creative destruction or bankruptcy. In order to have a, in order to have a dynamic economy and move forward and, and get good jobs and have new companies go, there's going to be loss of jobs, layoffs, and other things in old industries, or perhaps even the newer industries because of new technology and new things. But the thing is that dynamism helps grow and help everybody else out over time. And of course, you know too, human behavior doesn't change either. We all hate it when we see a plant close in a town, but we all don't really 
say much when 25 businesses come up in its place and employ those same people after they've upgraded their skills. My point is we're always going to have some kind of government subsidy like unemployment insurance or some kind of health care or fire or police <coughs> protection and always some kind of capitalistic modality at the end. The difference is not a matter of capitalism versus socialism, but to the degree of how much social benefits you want in the society. Those that have a lot that are by government mandate usually slow down and choke and wind up with a lot of de deficit. Those that don't and have a little bit more of a capitalistic edge to it tend to prosper more because of a lower taxable environment. Yes, government has always played a role in, in a country. You know, we have here in our country a system of freedom guaranteed by the Constitution with a system of checks and balances. And yes, it does get a little out of whack sometimes with our current president. But we did elect him, and we can de-elect him in, in less than a year. Yes, we have other things that, that, that need to be done in terms of infrastructure and everything else. But there is something called taxation, revenue bonds, and, and other mechanisms that can help build it. When you really see government working in action is when we go to war. And there's a desperate need for something. They'll go all out and build it. But in a lot of cases, we don't normally have to do that. About climate change, the best thing we can do is to take a little bit of the restraints off the nuclear power industry and let them develop the small modular reactors powered by thorium. I and mean, I've talked about this many a time. Cheap energy would do great to uh, help solve climate change. Anyway, I'm going to be, I could ramble on and on, and I know i got maybe a couple more minutes. But I'll just put it this way. Capitalism works over investment in social benefits and a socialistic economy does not because it tends to towards authoritarianism. Milton Friedman had it right. When you have economic freedom, you also have political freedom. <coughs> when you have equality of opportunity, and you have different outcomes, that also works. We all kind of start out here in our country with about the same level of economic opportunity for educated well enough and we, you know, have a, have a decent education. But you do have upward mobility in the United States. And that changes from time to time. I'm not against corporations because they are sometimes the most efficient way to do business. And sometimes with the amount of investment needed in new technology, it's the only way you can really roll it out. Our model today is, well, anyway, do you have a question? I do. I mean, you know, you, I, I know your position on capitalism, but what I see is basically the corporations in this country that are now people are basically run, running the show, and we yes. don't really get a voice in these elections. Well, that's yes. because a lot of times those same corporations are asking for special favors from the government. And which and is something that we should be fighting. We, I mean, how are we going to fight them if we we can't compete with the amount of money that corporations have to buy the legislation? The antitrust legislation that under under T, Teddy Roosevelt, um, there are several ways that we can get together to do so. <coughs> and as a matter of fact, I still think the most effective way to control a corporation is to write their CEO a letter and say, hey, I don't like the way you're doing business or don't do business with some of those that are really uh, egregious. Any corporation that I know of that's going to have its image hurt in the public relations realm does more, coming from a customer of that corporation, does more effect than any government mandate would ever do. Like military contractors? Military contractors are some... letter? No, if we you, don't if like you, your products. Stop, stop building these things. You know, if enough, there was a time that enough people protested oh. about nuclear weapons, not maybe about 20 years ago, that there was actively, some of the governments were not actively upgrading them as much. And there was not as much a thing. 
If something you need to demonstrate, you need to make your voice known, you need to be an active citizen. So we should put pressure on Congress so that they don't uh, buy into the... Uh, well, the thing, what you really want to start out with, the local pressure is on like a company like Walmart coming into a town and acting with a special TIF district or acting in the fact that they're getting special favors from their local government because they're claiming they got all these jobs. The problem we have is in the... I say the problem we have is that a lot of people are not actively involved enough against the cor corruption we see already. Yes? What do you think about the idea that the corporations okay. get all their power and status and privilege from the government? How can you support corporations when they get LLCs? That's a protection and insulation from responsibility, for legal responsibility for their actions and an insulation from competition. So corporations and government contracts and Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they'll get the government contracts. That's a rigged market. How do you think that's free enough? I don't. Okay, good. You need to get, that's where you have special privilege coming in. That's exactly what Adam Smith railed against. Well, One of his big... a corporation that doesn't get anything from the government. Repeal so you're citizen tonight. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Those yeah, LLCs yeah, yeah, yeah. have been very effective in bringing up a lot of small business innovation, too. But I can't compete against them now because of those LLCs, those protections and privileges for business. It's not a free market. Amazon is not an LLC. All right. We'll move on. Yes, everybody. Yes, Hello. One full at a time, guys. Come on. Order. When our founding fathers put together the Constitution. Hello. When our founding fathers put together the Constitution. They uh, oh, yeah. were asked by a lady as they were walking out what kind of a government we have, and Ben Franklin answered and said, a, uh, a republic if you can keep it. Now after that they had a conversation with one another, and they, the question was, how long do you think this government will last? And they pretty much agreed that it would last about a hundred years. Now, I want to bring this up because about a hundred years later, Teddy Roosevelt was our president. And he went after the big trusts, which was, in effect, going after capitalism. So, uh, when people stand up here and want to say that Teddy Roosevelt did this and did that, and that he was so great, Teddy Roosevelt wasn't so great. And I want to make that absolutely clear. So, uh, our government began to fall apart about a hundred years after the founders did their part. And when, it, when that happened, it started with Teddy Roosevelt. And then, of course, uh, when uh, Woodrow Wilson got in, he put in the income tax and the Federal Reserve, which also went, made great strides in destroying capitalism. Thank you. I'd like to say that I agree with the previous speaker who said capitalism is more dynamic than socialism. The creative destruction does work. We Up until we got a Russian agent in the White House back in 2016, 2017, we won the Cold War based on capitalism, but capitalism has problems. I agree with Teddy Roosevelt in breaking up the trust. I agree right now that the corporations have way too much power and we're way too out of whack. And a great disparity of wealth and of the oligarchy that we have threatens our democracy. And we also have a lot of monopolies. Just try and buy something. You have to go to Amazon. Just try and get a cable company. You have to go to Comcast. We don't have as much competition as we should. Unfortunately, some of our greatest presidents were tinted by racism, and that goes for, for uh, um, uh, Jackson, 
that goes for uh, Teddy Roosevelt, it goes for Woodrow Wilson, it even goes for FDR who interned the Japanese during World War II. Racism has always been our Achilles heel. And now Trump has actually brought racism because he's such an open racist, uh, even though he never admit it. He's brought it to the forefront. We've got to lance this, this oil and we've got to face it and try to reason and overcome and work for equal opportunity. I, I'm waiting the credit card machine. That's it. Any rebuttal or question? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a lot to uh, uh, argue about with the speaker, but there is one thing I like, a point I'd like to make is there is some talk about um, egalitarianism as it applies to uh, Thanksgiving. And I'd like to point out uh, that there is a, uh, a group that's treated horribly on Thanksgiving. That's the American turkey. And, uh, and I think that you should keep them in mind if you want to practice true egalitarianism. Um, so uh, uh, I did want to take this time to talk about something that has nothing to do with uh, uh, with the, the uh, topic, and, uh, but I think it's important, and I'll take liberties and talk about uh, the uh, impeachment uh, investigation. Um, Dr. Hill, I think, in my opinion, is seems to be uh, for left-leaning media seems to be a focal point of someone who's. Uh, really honing in on a serious problem with the right, and that is, is they're spreading uh, false narratives, especially about uh, the uh, trying to trying to dismiss the fact that Russia tried to interfere, and to some degrees did interfere in our democratic election. And um, my, my personal opinion is there was some testimony that I thought was uh, just as telling, if not more telling. There was a testimony that uh, Trump and his minions were pushing Zelensky to make an announcement that they were investigating um, uh, the, tr the Bidens. Uh, but the, the, uh, the details of that is they didn't actually care if the investigation proceeded. They just wanted the announcement from the president of the Ukraine. The reason that I think that is telling is because this sort of falls into what I think the biggest threat of Trump is. He, his strong suit is controlling narratives, is creating these storylines, uh, regardless of the truth, that support his political agenda. So when he's sitting here saying, well, I, don't, I don't care, or his minions anyway, are sitting there saying, we don't care if Ukraine investigates Biden. We just want you to announce that you're investigating the Bidens. Trump is going to take that, and he's going to beat that like a drum. That's, that's what I think his plan was. And that is basically his modus operandi, which is taking half-truths and, and with, through implication, implying falsehoods, like, oh, he can walk around and say, the, he would have said it. He would have said it just endlessly about how the Bidens are being investigated. This is announced by the president. It's not me. It's announced by Ukraine. He, he's being investigated. This is the big danger that I think that we face. I, I was talking to Andy, and he was saying how... Um, uh, how uh, uh, Trump is evil, and uh, the people that support Trump, it's a cult. And I respectfully disagree with that. I, 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 I'm on the same page emotionally where I'm against Trump, but I just don't assess conservatives as evil or cult-like. You know, we live in a, a democratic society where we're going to have two or three different opinions. And I just think they're misled. I think they're basing, they're taking their emotional belief system and they're, and they're basing policy support on false narratives that are supported by Trump and worse, Fox News. Uh, I read this in, uh, in, uh, on the news that um, 
would Nixon had survived his impeachment if Fox News had existed? And that's a scary idea because there's what we know about Fox News and how they operate, there's a good chance that Nixon would have stayed in office if there had been a Fox News. So I don't have, I have one suggestion. It's not a big suggestion, but this just is a pet peeve that pisses me off to no end. Everybody talks about Hannity on Fox News and all the other talking heads on Fox News. I think that we need to stop giving them the courtesy of calling that whole network Fox News. They labeled the whole network Fox News, and most of it is not news, and that's bullshit. And we stop, have to stop feeding into this, this a label, a false label. We have to start calling it the Fox Network and confronting anybody who remotely wants to imply that this is news. It is not news. Hannity is not news. It's just a bunch of propaganda. Now, I don't know how much that's going to go to uh, creating a, a discussion about this false information, um, but I don't know. I think it might help a little, and, uh, and I think that um, we just need to keep combating the false narrative that's out there and confronting any false stories that we can, even if it's just in conversation. Mike, Nixon, Nixon, he's our man. Humphrey's in the garbage can. Come on up. Come on up. Our, our, speaker, our speaker just said one thing. You teach seventh graders in order to solve any problem, you got to first correctly identify the problem. And then you can go for the school. All right. Consider this. All right, and then you're next. All right, Dave, the, 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 the microphone's off right now. I'm not doing this to speak loudly. First, with regard to turkeys, my aunt, my only question is white meat or dark? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, with regard to the question that was about Fox News, sure it has news, about as much news as Pravda did, as as Vestia did or as the Hitler's own paper, the Folkester Beal Bacher did. I think that pretty well sums it up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, sir. I wasn't going to talk, but uh, Justin told me that we should all have uh, our own fighting words. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle off my own platitudes loud, here. Loud, please. I know the microphone doesn't work, so I'll talk louder. Um, I want to thank Germinal for inviting me here. I actually spoke here three years ago about libertarianism, and this place does not change at all. So, <laughs> hey, you guys have your thing. That's cool. Uh, I'm going to promote my own uh, podcast it's called The Invictus Mind. We all have to have a platform. And I don't think this room is big enough to change the, uh, the country as a whole. First thing I want to say is uh, egalitarianism is, is bogus. There is no uh, equality of outcome. There's no equality of opportunity either. Nobody is born into equality of opportunity. We're born poor, we're born rich, we're born black, white, male, female. There is no such thing as equality of, of opportunity. There's no such thing as equality of outcome. Equality is not achievable. It's just not. So every single one of us has the opportunity to do what they want to do, and if you feel threatened, if you feel like you're oppressed, then you're just living in, in a falsehood because that's not true. And uh, I was going to say, you guys talking about Fox News and CNN and everything else, you're all watching too much news. Stop <laughs> watching the damn news, okay? Because you're getting false information from everywhere. You want to be happy, turn the TV off, don't watch the news. Because, you know, Mark Twain said there are lies, damn lies, and then there are statistics, right? And news is the same thing. <laughs> Where do you find the truth if it's not on the news? Where would you look for what's going on in the world? Well, you know, I know where to find the truth, but I don't know how many people are religious in here, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, but the free speech network. There you go. And the other thing is, there's only one way to save this country, okay? Stop referring to the United States as a nation. It's not a nation, okay? This is federalism. This is a federalist society. We have 50 independent states. The problem is that everybody wants 330 million people to live under one ideology, whether it's libertarianism, socialism, capitalism, or you name it, ism. Okay? One of my favorite podcasters and author, he's a story by the name of Brian McClanahan. He has a mantra. He says, think locally, act locally. Okay? And I think it was Gandhi who said, be the change you want to be in the world, you want to see in the world. So worry about your own town. Stop worrying about what the president does, okay? There is no good president. 
Okay? There has never been a good president because the president does not have authority over us as individuals. And finally, Justin, taxation is theft. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next. All right, we still got an open mic. Andy, please. Charlie's coming. Charlie is coming. Oh, no. All right, Charlie. You want to talk, Andy? <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker. Yeah. 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 Oh, happy, happy holiday. Thank you very much. Happy holiday to all of you. Uh, it's coming up next week, rather. We follow you after. Him speaks. I'll be eclectic as usual here. When aren't you eclectic? A <laughs> <laughs> uh, variety of things regarding taxation is theft, government is violence. Uh, we're, I'll, I, I, I'll, I'll tell the Libertarian Party, drop this hyperbole. <laughs> I'm serious. Oh, yeah. If you yeah. want to be a mainstream party, when I heard that the first time, I remember where I was at, at a meeting after the College of Complexes in Belmont, and I heard that and I said, that's an incredible, poor statement to make. <laughs> I'm serious. You, you will not hear any, any uh, stable uh, well, people in Washington that say things like this. You will find uh, that the government is violent. This government is not violent. There are, there, there are violent governments on Earth. Well, you should hear a lawyer. You know, the, you know the U.S. Code. Are there laws with cruel and unusual punishment? I mean, we may have the prison and police system, but uh, to say that the law, rule, and regulation are mistreatment is, is an absurdity. I'm serious. Drop, your, drop this kind of thing. There, there are uh, people that commit acts of violence to getting licensed people to go up there to go. And I don't think you should be doing that at all. That's the you think it's funny or you guys but not He's so drop it the July. Or, drop it all together. Talk it among yourselves. Uh, by the way, act global uh, think globally, act globally. It's the uh, original model of the Green Party back in the seventies. Um, Let's see what else we got here. Uh, yeah, I mean, to say the government is violent, I, 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 I was thinking of Germany, pre-war Germany, where they had something called the Hitler Law. And before you said something that perhaps wasn't proper to somebody you knew, you had to look around. And they called that the Hitler Law. You don't have totalitarian state like this. I mean, the, the most oppressive thing that I've heard that people are saying is uh, um, speed cameras. I mean, this is not it. We have concentration camps. You know, Yes, and there's a significant objection to that. And there are and, and, and challenges to that. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are two things that this, there's two things, that, I'll tell you, there are two things that this country should be shameful of. One was that we're engaged in torture under Bush. He said there's no cruel and unusual punishment. Fucking liar. There's torture? Well, but no, seriously, there's two things the United States did that were a blemish on its record. One was uh, engaging in torture of the Bush administration. They were doing it in other countries or under contract. And the other thing, like here, the, the separation of children from their parents. There was nothing like that. And believe you me, that was contested. Um, but the executive, executive office is, you know, there certainly were efforts. To, my God, it's still going on um, to try to bring. But when you got, yeah, that, that's, that's Trump's entire domestic policy is what? The wall. He has no domestic policy. You talk about egalitarianism here. It's not to talk about egalitarianism. Nothing like that that wants to bring a better life for people. But you, you have to want to bring the greatest good for the greatest number. What's wrong with that? That's that's one you gotta think about. Say, well well what is our public policy? Well, that's to make things better for as many people as we can. I heard something earlier that um, 
corporations get stuff from the government. That's true. Consumers get stuff from the government. Um, probably corporations get a bit more because they got the money. Uh, there are special interest groups of every industry, lumber, sugar, trucking, what have you, and there's this big competition in Congress to uh, help things turn out the way you like. Uh, that's an ongoing thing. But regarding this, I have another thing. Socialism doesn't work. Well, let's, let's do a little thought experiment. Let's say we were in the middle of the ocean in a boat. And we only had one jug of water. There are a whole bunch of us. And I heard uh, whoever gets to drinks from that jug, I, I wrote this down. Our speaker said, uh, those who have the, the proper, proper skill set. I now I would say that everybody gets to drink the water the same amount equally. But should we set up a system where only those should water based on their skill set? Now that's a funny way of thinking about it. But essentially, skill set would be if you could get the the number of people to throw a whole bunch of the other people out of the boat, that would increase your chances of survival. Because you're bigger and you got a skill set, so throw a couple of people overboard. Which boat well, is that's it? A, is that a private I mean, that's, that's what you're dealing with. Uh, to argue that <coughs> people, shouldn't, people shouldn't share equally among the water of that boat, I don't perceive how you can present any argument. Uh, about that, if you think there's some there's some system, you use them. You talk about the problem of egalitarianism. The problem is, is in equalitarianism. What system do you come up with to determine who gets water on that boat? That would be fair. Capitalist. Anyhow, thank you very much. Come again, Germano. Charge for the drinks. <laughs> Charge for the drinks. Any other rebuttals? <laughs> Anybody else want to give a rebuttal? All right, come on up. All right. German, all you'll get the last word in a minute. Okay. My late husband said, and I guess this is really true, that all government, even the best of governments, is based upon force. If you don't do it, we're going to have to arrest you or whatever. But you know what? This government is supposed to be us. We're supposed to be the government. Now, I admit I have been unable to stop Donald Trump from ripping kids away from uh, uh, their parents. Okay, but we are trying. We are resisting. Government should be representative of the people. We should be, as much as possible, the government. And we should be able to influence our government. And that's why I want to break up monopolies and, and have limits on corporate control. Anybody get sick to their stomach reading the non- uh, lawsuit, the binding arbitration agreements that you have to click yes on, I agree. Every time you sign a contract, every time you, you get a new uh, website on your phone, that is our the result and the fruit of our right-wing Supreme Court. Taking uh, uh, prerogatives and rights away from consumers, giving them to corporations, it's gone too far. And we got to stop it. Thanks. All right, Mr. Travis. Uh, give me one minute here. Uh, I just like to say, uh, in response to the gentleman in the back, there are veterans groups all over this country now. Veterans like myself, and veterans from the Korean War. I'm from the Vietnam War era. There's Gulf War veterans. They're all basically saying the same thing now, educating the public. The U.S. military is widely recognized outside the United States is the largest killing machine on the planet. And the books I'm going to bring next week uh, is called Common Sense for the 21st Century. It's about extinction rebellion. The only thing that changes governments is not just voting politely. It's getting millions of people in the streets and shutting cities down. That's happening now all over the world, piece by piece. And that's what it's going to take, millions of us in the streets, to push our representatives to do the right thing before our country comes to the civil war that Trump is protesting or promoting. promoting. He's, uh, Trump is promoting 
civil war with uh, an armed faction of the, uh, that think they have the right to carry guns. And we're already seeing it with the police. There's a segment of police in this country that just pull out their guns and gun down black and minority people that are unarmed. It's happening all over the South and the West. And the media, for most of the time, doesn't cover it. So come next week, and uh, we'll have uh, more updates on it. The other thing, there, if you want to know what's really going on, log on to the website called Common Dreams. That's the single best website I know of. There's no advertising. It's reader-supported. And I haven't seen a single article on there that could be considered left or right-wing propaganda that you can debunk. They just tell you what's happening. CommonDreams.org. If you haven't been looking at that, uh, it's a breath of fresh air compared to our mainstream news. Thank you. All right. Regarding the uh, the uh, shipwreck and the boat with the survivors on it, if I'm the guy that brought the water on that boat, then I'm going to give everybody a drink who wants one, whether they have money or not, because they're all going to have to pay for it when we get back to civilization. And I not only am going to demand payment, but I'm going to demand a uh, payment at uh, 10 and a half percent. So if we're out at sea for three months, then they're all going to have to pay the payment for the water and for the uh, the uh, credit that I extended to them. <laughs> uh, and that's that. So everybody will be able to drink, but everybody will have to pay. Thank you. Take yeah, advantage. I was going to tackle that slightly differently, um, but uh, Dave Travis is always pungent when making a point. Uh, I was going to say that just, you know, having four people stranded on a raft in the middle of the ocean, if this wasn't a pleasure cruise, but like an emergency or an accident, even none other than the late Ayn Rand talked about the extraordinary nature of emergencies being a time to waive her normal rules of individualism for emergency generosity. Uh, Charlie, there's also a great classic episode of The Simpsons where Homer and the junior campers are stranded on a rubber raft out at sea. And no form of egalitarianism generates the one thing they need, more fresh water. Uh, but maybe they end up being rescued because the show has been on for decades. Um, on a slightly more serious note, the idea of the definition of the state or the government or a regime as the, the organization that has a legitimate monopoly on the use of force in a society is not some crackpot libertarian notion that we came up with. That is a very deeply entrenched uh, idea from philosophy and sociology, most famous from Max Weber a uh, hundred years ago, great German sociologist, but with roots going as far back as Thomas Hobbes, and even a century before him, uh, a French legal philosopher named Jean Baudin, B-O-D-I-N. Hey, what's not an alibi? It's just intellectual history, but I'm, I'm secure in who I am and that I know that, and I'm able to say it on camera and into the microphone. Political power is best achieved by the end of a barrel of a gun. And, and one question I will leave you with, this is completely unrelated to Germinal's idea tonight, but it's a mass unemployment question. If the United States federal government were, or state governments were to seize control of the health insurance sector, what would be done to reemploy or train or take care of the needs of all of the people to be furloughed from the private health insurance sector. Not everyone has that fully worked out. Thank you very much. Journal, you get the last word. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you for having me tonight. It was, it was a pleasure, of course, to, to debate my fellow socialist friends, you know, it's always, it's always interesting. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to come back again. I don't know when, but I will definitely come back, Chuck, and then 
Yeah, I would have set up. Unless you don't want me to come, let me know. But, you know. <laughs> Plug your book and website, too, Be don't forget. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the book is on Amazon for anyone who wants to purchase it on Amazon directly. But I also have some copies, so yeah, just. How much? 12. Yeah. So yeah, you guys can contact me then. Is there a website that we can reach you at? Uh, I mean, so far I use social media, so Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys, and until next time. Thank you. Have a show, Andy. Okay, that, that's it for tonight. Uh, we're out, and uh, we will see you all in the next video. We're out. Thank you.